we're still not at the top as I see it, and we haven't had the really the big blow off top yet. So obviously we will not see a recession here by uh, June or August or anything like that. But I still think we're going to see it by end of this year. And the market top is most likely to be in, uh, let's say, uh, September, maybe oct October of this year. Also, when it comes to the uh, to a recession, there are so many indications that the labor market is deteriorating. And this is the real economy, the labor market and the housing market, the housing market has already deteriorated and we see how the a lot of the index there are down, you know, significantly. Um, and I think they'll take another tumble. So the, the, the consumer is struggling right now and that is what is going to bring the economy into a recession. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the JR Mining Guy on Twitter. And of course, your host for this conversation. Really looking forward to welcoming back Henrik Zeberg. He's the head of macro at Swissblocks and also co-founder of the Zeberg Report. He's a frequent guest here on the channel. We have him on about every four to five months to keep to keep track on what he's forecasting, where we're standing on the blow off top and to, how are the markets doing in general. Really appreciate his convers or the conversations with him. So we always appreciate him taking the time to come back. Lots to recap. Uh, lots has happened since January. Last we chatted, the market expected almost six to seven rate cuts. And uh, now we're down to one, maybe two. So we're going to recap his forecast as well and to see where we're at uh, on the economy. It's like, how is the U.S. consumer doing? And uh, we also discussed that we're going to talk about a little bit about the EU. How's European consumer doing? What's the monetary uh, divergence or what, what do we call it? The monetary policy divergence look like and what are the what, what does it cause? Like, why has the EU lowered interest rates and the U.S. hasn't, for example? So we're going to take a look at that and contrast the both or the, the, the two of them. So. Um, before I switch over to my guest, you guys know the spiel. There's somewhere down there is a subscribe button. We tremendously appreciate if you were to hit that because we can bring guests like Henry on more frequently and uh, invite other phenomenal guests as well. So it is much appreciated. Now, without much further ado, Henry, it is great to see you again. Thank you so much for making the time. Thank you for having me back on again. Yeah, I can't wait. Like, I'm really looking forward to the next 40 minutes here, Henry, because we got so much to chew through and uh, some, some calls to sort of discuss that you made in January, like... Recession call, for example, is the big one, of course, that everybody uh, has has been talking about. But uh, why don't we start with a bit of a summary first and try to understand, like, how, how is the economy doing? Maybe the U.S. economy and then global economy. Okay, so so I have to say, you know, the U.S. and uh, is driving the global economy. So even though we, you know we would like to think that we we matter a whole lot here in the in Europe, we, we actually when it comes to to the financial markets and it comes to the economy, it's really about the U.S. So if the U.S. is well, well, then the rest of the world is also kind of good. Um, but it's and you you you'll probably never see a situation or not for the next many years where Europe will be the one that is powering through and then the U.S. will, you know, be the one that is uh, you know uh, lagging behind. So I think it is about the U.S. very often. But of course there is a big you know area here also called EU and Asia and, and elsewhere. So we need to discuss that as well. Um, and I think, you know, you said, you know, how are things doing? Uh, sorry about that, Kai. I just need to pick back on this. But so, yeah, I, what I see, think, yeah, well, I, I, call, I had a recession call that I, I called there in, in January and uh, and I still stick to that. I, we, we're just we're here in July, no, early July, and uh, we start to see some of the fallouts of that, of the of the deterioration that I was expecting. As I said back then, I'm pretty sure I said uh, we, we have, the, you know, the, the, the business cycle that is slowly turning over. We have the leading indicators that have been telling us for some time that they're a recession will be coming. Um, then we have had this uh, spike in the markets that is uh, that I also think I call for the uh, the S and P moving up. I think it was as a, was was a thousand points in the S and P since January. Uh, we're still not at the top as I see it, and we haven't had the really the big blow off top yet. So obviously we will not see a recession here by uh, June or August or anything like that. But I still think we're going to see it by end of this year, and the market top is most likely to be in. Uh, let's say uh, September, maybe oct October of this year. So, so there's not many changes, but yes, as you said, also there's a, you know we postponed the thing because the economy has been stronger, the labor market has been more resilient than I expected back then. Uh, but that is just the name of the game. Sometimes we, I mean, it's about being on the right side of the fence, right side of the trade, and being long the market and risk on has been right for now. I think still is, uh, and uh, and for a little while longer, and we will then eventually see that the deterioration that we now see also with the most recent numbers coming into the economy 
that is just normal. That is what I expected. That is exactly what the coincident indicators should be doing now, as the uh, as the leading indicators have been telling us. So no changes, but small postponement. So the PMI numbers are not leading indicators in my in my model. The PMI numbers are something that is uh, other uh, business uh, cycle analysts are using, but they are not leading indicators in my models. But 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 anyway, the coincident indicators. What I see there is the deterioration that we saw from the leading indicators will spill over into the the coincident indicators. So so what we have seen for so long is a labor market that has been stubbornly strong, and you can understand why. So into the uh, into the Corona crisis and after the stimulus came out, a lot of businesses around the world were doing really well. People, uh, you know, any business that uh, were just seeing their numbers going up because stimulus coming in brings demand in, brings you know a lot of you know consumption also in, and that that's why you know businesses will do do well whatever kind of business you're in. So we saw also an extraordinary uh, demand for labor and build up of capacity in uh, across the board and across all businesses around the world. And of course, when you build out that bis that you know. Uh, that extra capacity, it will take a little while before you as a business say, oh, we were actually wrong in bringing those 20, for, you know, 20 extra people in or whatever it was. We need to lay those positions off again. So what they first do is that the, the, the spike we also saw in, in open positions around the um, in the U.S. market again. Well, we, we actually seen the, that come down really strongly. So the open uh, positions are coming down strongly and are now down to levels that we saw just around the, the outbreak of the uh, of the uh, yeah, of the Corona crisis. And, and uh, yeah, with that recession, short recession we had there. So that is coming down. That is the first thing that the, the businesses will cut. The next thing that will then start to cut is, you know, how many hours do we need people to work and try to adjust that to make sure they don't need to lay pe people off. And then later on, you're going to see the layoffs. So I think we're starting to see that next wave here now that we're going to see the layoffs coming in because that's that's the next that's the next thing. And if you look at the corporate profit uh, numbers that came out, uh, I think it's a couple of weeks ago, they were not fantastic, absolutely not. And that is pretty, telling us that uh, the that the consumption is not there, that the, the demand is not there, and this is because of the consumer. Back to the consumer, which have now been using the excess excessive uh, savings that they have seen or they have been building up over the the last uh, the la yeah, since the Corona crisis, and now they are starting to cut spending, and and this is what brings the economy into a, into a recession. And nothing new there. There's nothing new under the sun here. It's really what we have seen so many times before. It's just because it's been, it lasted a little longer because of this extreme spike we saw in the um yeah because of the, the major stimulus we got after the corona crisis yeah it's interesting let's break down the consumer a little bit i want to talk about it a little more it's it's vitally important in the us which is a service-based economy so if the consumer is doing well the economy is typically doing quite well but again we're getting mixed signals like household debt is rising for example right and uh, they're a bit more cautious on spending they're substituting they might be buying uh the the cheaper pork sausage instead the all beef frank sausages for their hot dogs for example um can you break the consumer down a little bit and uh, like sort of explain like where the fears are coming from and why we should be paying attention to the consumer so much I think I think this is breaking it way down too much because that's really just about two things when it comes to the consumer. This is about the housing market and it's about the labor market. If we think about ourselves, we got a job. For as long as we got a job, we are happy because then we got you know got we got an in, uh, we got an income. But we also, if we look at the housing market, if our if our houses you know uh, move up in price, well, we feel that we are well uh, better off, and then we'll probably also be more prone to spend more. But the thing is that we've seen because of the interest spike, uh, interest rate spike that we saw because of the inflation. Coming Coming up, we've seen now the consumers getting hit on the interest, personal interest payments, and that that move we have seen in that has been the strongest that we have seen in the last seventy years, or you know, for as long as I have data anyway. And if that is really what is what what is causing the concern here, so the so what the first happens is that the consumer has their whatever kind of debt or loans they have, you know, across the um, 
across their economy there and then they will they will you know start to see that they have to spend more money on actual, on interest payments and and the you don't go sell your house first and you cannot just pay down your the, the debt you have on your car or whatever it is so you will have to cut spending elsewhere and that is the slow deterioration that happens this this is the business cycle this is how it works so every time we see that you know the interest rate uh, rates come up we actually and especially when they come up as fast as they have done this time what the consumer will do we can just think like you know you and I here, what we will do then is that I will use some of the savings we have to make sure we don't, you know, we don't have to sell the house. And then at some point we'll start to say, okay, we need to do something extra because things are not good. They are not turning, you know, the, we still have to pay this, you know, extreme amount in interest payments and that level has not come down yet. So the consumer is struggling right now. And if you start to look at the credit card delinquencies and, and you, what, you know, what we normally look at as well, you see that uh, actually, if you look at a range of change, you'll actually see that these are coming up uh, faster or as fast as we saw into the financial crisis. Wonder why? Well, the consumer is spending all their money on, on interest payments. So yes, consumption will be, you know, will be the next thing. And, and the next thing again will also be that the, the, the labor market will see a clear deterioration. And I think we're starting to see that the initial claims are now creeping up. They are a little higher, not, not high as they supposed to be before recession, but it's, uh, if you get, there are certain indicators that you can look at. Um, there's one that is called the Sandler Piper uh, indicator, which is already triggered also when it comes to the uh, to a recession there are so many indications that the labor market is deteriorating and this is the real economy the labor market and the housing market the housing housing market has already deteriorated and we see how the a lot of the index there are down you know significantly um, and i think they will take another tumble so the, the the consumer is struggling right now and that is what is going to bring the economy into a recession and this is will be like jumping on ice i mean you don't you don't fall through until the moment you fall through and that's the, that's the problem. Problem when you get wet, you'll get wet, and you'll get very cold. So I think this is what we're going to see this time around again, and we are very close to that moment. that that's what we always experience when we see uh, when we see a recession uh, it may you know when you ask you know ordinary person people will they will say well what was the cause of the financial crisis it was the lehman the collapse of the lehman brothers it was not it was nine months into the recession so it was not it was the the slow deterioration of the economy now you call it the the death of the thousand cuts i mean this is what we see all the time the thousand cuts is is you know what we see on the consumer they are getting you know hurt by the interest rates payments and then you sl slowly start to see that you know seeping through into the economy into everything that they do and then all of a sudden you'll see that they, you know things are just getting to the point where the the the, the the businesses will start laying off people and this is the point we're getting to so far the consumers have been able to keep their spending up even though retail sales numbers are not great but i think they'll become even worse soon uh, but and then you'll see that the, the the businesses will will also start to see uh you know that they need to cut their workforce because they have to adjust accordingly this is the point where we'll start to see the layoffs this is the point where it really starts to become a problem in the economy and if you look at it Again, if you look at it from a cyclical perspective, we have exactly the same kind of development we had into the financial crisis. I mean, there's so many similarities. It's you know just as extraordinary that nobody actually sees it. But now, yes, the PMI numbers, which is uh, the SA, uh, ISM numbers that we saw yesterday come, coming out there, well, they were they were not great, and this was but this is expected uh, as according to my model. Yeah. Maybe last question on the consumer, and I wrote down like the buzzword is bubble behavior. And uh, one, one headline that really fits the bill here is a CNBC headline, like 36% of Americans plan to take on debt for summer travel. Okay. Um, so I'm curious, like, are they still expecting to be bailed out once doo doo hits the fan here? Like, you, like that bubble behavior, I'm curious, like, where do you put that? Because, or do we see bubble behavior like that? I'm not sure we see bubble behavior in spending. And again, I think, you know, we have to go down to the ordinary Mr. 
Jensen here in Denmark that, you know, what is it that he or she can do in terms of, you know, with the, with the money they have at hand. And, and of course, people will be looking into say, okay, we really need this. So we'll, you know, we'll try to take a loan out to, to see if we can, you know, to to have that kind of or do that kind of you know spending or have that kind of spending um, but i think the bubble behavior is more on the financial market and i think there will also be a disconnect between what we see in the financial market and the kind of you know expectations there in terms of now the fed is finally coming in and starting will help us you know and save the day and they will bring a lot about a lot of liquidity so i think that kind of behavior is more on the on the financial market i think the the, the ordinary consumer in, in in the us in denmark and in, in europe uh is um is struggling uh and, and they are that because of very you know concrete reasons they they are paying a lot of money in interest rates right now on an average basis i know that there are people that have you know different kinds of loan but if you look at the loan the the, the debt levels now are so much higher than they were in 2008 and now we have the interest rates up at those levels again if that was a problem back then i'm surprised to see why people can't understand that debt is a problem these days again as well so some people may want to say, well, we'll take out another loan here, but, and, and again, interest rates will also be dropping into the, into the recession. So maybe it'll be easier for them to pay it off, but chances are, or risks are, a risk is that we will see a lot of people losing their jobs as well. So, so Hendrik, for some reason, I've been watching the big short every three months and uh, there's always somebody who's winning, like the, like the mortgage brokers who are bragging. Right, um, in, in in the movie. So so who's winning right now? Like if you have a look at the markets, uh, it, it seems quite bifurcated. But who are the winners in the, the this time around? So for now, until now, it's been the ones that have been risk on. I mean, risk on since uh, October twenty two has been good, and uh, and I I've been there. Uh, I and I think the, we will see that for you know for some more months we'll see that the you know the pure risk on risk on assets uh, will be the ones that will be will doing well and we are sitting here today and talking when while Bitcoin is a, in a plunge and I say I still see Bitcoin at one hundred and ten thousand so I'm not uh, I'm not too worried about what we see right now here uh, I think Bitcoin cryptos and and uh, and also uh, small caps will have a fantastic rally here uh, into the moment of the, uh, the, the when the recession hits and I think we're very close to the moment where the Fed is at least going to start talking about a cut. Uh, I don't think necessarily they will cut here in July. We have the next uh, FOMC meeting in September. I think probably that would be the first month of cutting. And normally we see that the market tops out around that moment. So the market top in September or in October could be uh, could be the case. And that means that until then it's risk on. It's ri and I think you know for a lot of assets and we have. We are nowhere near the animal spirit that I'm expecting. So I, I think we will get, you know, a lot of that into the coming top. Uh, so so these are the winners for now, but they will definitely not be the winners in the next phase. A market usually takes a, or front runs sort of it, its predictions. It, it prices things in. Like how, how much is a, a rate cut already priced in in September? When you say that the, the top is going to hit in, in September with the rate cut in September, like isn't there usually a bit of a, what do you call it, like a time gap? Right where the market starts to anticipate front runs a decision, and then it gets when it, when it actually happens. Usually the market drops. Is that is that sort of what you're predicting there? I I don't like this 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 about that everything is about what the Fed does because if you really you look at it, you'll actually see that when the market when the, when the when the interest rates are going up and the and and the and the Fed is is hiking rates. These are the times when you have the largest rallies in the market. So I don't really, you know, buy into this. When the Fed starts to hike, it's uh, sorry. When the Fed starts to to cut rates, that is a moment when the economy is is starting to deteriorate, and that is a time where you also want to get out of markets. The time you want to be in a market, the time you want to be long risk asset, is when the Fed is, you know, seeing the economy and thinking, okay, we need to maybe. Uh, you know, hike rates or maybe um, stay, you know, uh, neutral here or stay, stay, uh, stay flat, because then they're there, you know, the markets know what to to, to deal with and uh, and they will be and they, they the economy is doing well. But but this is, is what should be in focus. This about that, you know, it's only about liquidity all the time. There's a certain part of the cycle where it is about liquidity. But by the end of the day, it's about the business cycle. It's about the real economy. And and so how much the, the the you know the market is you know anticipating in terms of the rate rate cut i think that the the, the expectation of liquidity is starting to build in the uh in the uh, in the markets because obviously uh with the, also with the numbers that we saw yesterday on the ism numbers we will start to 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 have you know people start to understand that of course the fed is not going to hike again i mean that would be stupid just you know pure stupidity and you know kind of never say that will not happen but anyway and and also that the, i think the dollar is going to come down 
down very strongly. So uh, into this, when we start to see the the uh, the weaker data in the uh, in the economies, and that means that you have a certain time where it's it's all about liquidity, and you'll have these people, liquidityists as I call them, that think that the business cycle are driven by liquidity, and that's why we should see um, the market just keep going up. And a lot of these people will do be, you know, running into the markets, and uh, so so. There are different dynamics here as I, as I see it, but in general terms, I like to be in the market when the Fed actually, you know, they, when they hike the rates. And uh, for now, it seems like the closer we get to the point where they want to, you know, cut the rates, the more, you know, concerned I will be about being in along the markets. Your, your Danish colleagues at Saxo Bank put out a Q3 report and uh, they, they use the term sandcastle economics. I really like that term because it really symbolizes um, that, that everything is quite fragile, like the whole the, the whole current economic boom, boom, and, and that's a strong word uh, that, that we're witnessing in the U.S. in particular right now is is extremely fragile. It's driven by excessive fiscal policies, and only very few sectors are benefiting, like AI, uh, obesity drugs, and uh, maybe semiconductors and defense, because you know the world we're in. But uh, you you look at liquidity is like one, once one of these sectors starts to crumble and maybe AI is in a bubble. If you look at 48, 48 times earnings for Nvidia it, as as a valuation metric, for example, like w what happens? Like what's the trigger? I'm trying to figure out. Like I'm trying to get a sense. Like what what comes first? Like is is the Fed the trigger? Is the economy the trigger? We're at the end of Q2 now. We're going to see some numbers potentially come out in the next few weeks. Um, some financial numbers from the companies. Like what what's going to trigger it first? And uh, Curious what your thoughts are. So, so it's never it's never a one moment kind of thing that triggers everything, and then boom, it all collapses. It's it's about the when when the, the economy has been deteriorating, when meaning the the consumer has been struggling for quite some time, and the and 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 they they simply do not the demand is simply not there any longer, and it starts to 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 you know to come down. Well, then the the, the companies have to to. To, to simply cut the uh, the number of people that they have employed. So this is a has, it's a super tanker turning. It's not a speedboat. And then all of a sudden it's like, boom, then it just turns around and we have the uh, really bad economy. We have an economy here that is late stage in the in the business cycle where we we see that the Fed will now start to, to think about, you know, cutting rates. And they do that because the economy is deteriorating. So so sandcastle economy, I don't think it is. I think, it, yeah, sandcastle, it is a sandcastle that 100 percent is going to come down and it's going to, to crash. I see there's no way out of this situation we have at this point here where we're not going to see a recession. I simply cannot envision that or see that. Uh, and that means also that a lot of the things that we have seen in terms of the moves up in, in now you're talking about NVIDIA and, and others are clear bubble, uh, you know, moves that we see. And yes, AI is in a bubble and will be for a little longer. And as I said, I haven't seen, I, I don't think I've seen the real animal spirit yet. Uh, I had a a great episode of uh, the last animal spirit back in 21 when I talked to some young guy in um, at a cafe and he was from a very wealthy ca family and he kind of told me what the, you know the non fungible tokens were all about and why I didn't understand that and why it would be the next thing. We're not there yet. We don't have that. We don't have all the Lambo guys out yet, just yet. Um, we will get there because the the crypto market will will absolutely develop into um, to you know these kinds of you know this kind of spirit will come out of that if the the move higher that I expect uh, is developing or will develop. Um, so so what we will see will be a slow deterioration, and even when the top is in the market, nobody will actually tell us this is the top. And and then we'll see a bounce back up again, and people will say, oh, now you see we're going back again, and then. You know, it'll first be at the moment where the the blow. You know, we really start to see the deterioration, and we have to think back to um, let's 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 just you know to do a, a history uh, or a walk down history uh, lane here, memory lane. If you look at 2007, you actually had the recession beginning in in December of 2007. The stock market top was in October of 2007, two months before. This is how much you know. Uh, the, the, the stock market to kind of you know um, predicts uh, let's say the economy the turn in the economy so like two months worth um, but what happened was that nobody really understood that that was the that was the moment that was the, that the stock market had turned it to in in uh, October of two thousand and seven um, and actually you had Bernanke coming out in February January February and March even I think saying oh we got some you know issues at hand here but we 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 don't see any recession and we were in a recession at that point that was that started in december 2007 already so people do not really see it before it actually starts to get bad 
Then you had in March of uh, 2008, you had the the first kind of fallouts from from the um, from the financial uh, crisis that were developing at that point. And again, it does that slowly. It's not something that just boom is there. And you had the Bear Stern Bear Stearns uh, situation. And everywhere else in the financial sectors, things were just deteriorating because the consumer were not well. This is what I think we'll see again. And I think we'll have another financial crisis this time around. So we will not see it just like which day is it? Boom, there we go. It will be a top in the market, let's say September, let's say October. There will be a, a, a recession beginning in December. Nobody will know about that. We'll see a the first decline into the markets, maybe into the early of 25. That was actually the top in, in late you know, uh, 24. But in 25, we'll, we'll even see a bounce into the first few months, maybe not to a new all time high, but just a, a new, another bounce. And then maybe as we get later later into 25, we'll start to see the real deterioration. That is how it turns. It's not a boom. So we we, we should not wait and sit for that. Wait and wait, sit and wait for this uh, the bell kind of you know ringing at the top, and then somebody will say, okay, now it's there. Uh, I will I will try to do it on Twitter, so but so you can wait for my bell. But but I think you will not see that in the um, in the mainstream media and the mainstream and uh, amongst the mainstream analysts. But you would think yeah, like fear mongering usually quite works quite well, even on mainstream media. It usually brings the clicks and the views. So I'm uh, surprised they, they haven't started uh, ringing the bell just yet. And maybe we'll see a bit more because uh, li- liquidity is a topic you mentioned. And uh, what, you know, the U.S. is spending like a drunken sailor. Like the, the monetary deficit is, is exploding. It's like $2 trillion a year right now uh, because the U.S. has to spend. Like defense, I mentioned earlier, is a big topic that's benefiting. The U.S. is in the middle of almost like a three-front war, it seems like, right now. Um, so uh, when the U.S. turns the tap off, is, is that also a signal? Or can the U- that, or maybe uh, the r- wrong way to approach this is like, will the U.S. turn the tap off? Like, is, is that or will it be forced to turn the tap off at some point? Is we curious what your thoughts are in the U.S. debt situation is the, the, sh- the, the short summary of my long question. Sure, I got that. But I, obviously, there is a there is an issue there. There is an a, you know an overspending issue, and there is an issue with that. If the U.S. at some point does not get their acts together and start understanding that they do not have a, a divine economy, and that they actually they need to match what you know the taxes and what they uh, and and what they spend, at some point it will be become a problem. Will it become a, pro- a problem right now? I don't think so. And actually, you have the uh, even though you know, the the. The death of uh, of the U.S. dollar has been, uh, you know, forecasted or been expected so many times. We don't see that. We have a very strong dollar, and and that is because there is just one, you know, uh, currency to rule them all, and that's uh, that's the uh, that's the U.S. dollar, which is also the case right now. And the the the, the, the very strange situation here is actually if the U.S. Uh, turns off the tap, so to speak, and does not have that kind of uh, deficit that they have right now, well, then the rest of the world will actually be starving in terms of U.S. dollars. So there is a need for the for the U.S. actually to keep that spending, to keep you know pushing a lot of dollars out there. And if they don't, well, then the rest of the world will will, will see a problem. So I think this is actually the the very foundation of a larger problem, a monetary problem that that we see, and that we we will be need to be fixed at some point, and we need, will need to see to get you know sound money back in, which will be part of a monetary reset that I think will come not into a deflationary crash because. What they will do there is simply just to do even more monetary printing, and they they will do that. But I think the next phase that we that I that I expect we could see would be a stagflationary phase, which would be like in a year and a half, two years from now, which could then you know um, you know dramatically change the whole setup, where where you know pouring more money on the system on, uh, into the system will be a, you know a big problem and it will cause more inflation. So I think. Um, it's not a pro- it is a problem. It's a fundamental problem. It's a fundamental problem that needs to be solved. But it's actually something that right now is not being felt as a problem because the dollar is so strong and the rest of the world needs this. But will become a problem the moment when we start to see an inflationary pressure building up, and that is also the moment when, when I think with their, their other tools will be needed. Uh, this about having you know uh, a free lunch and just you know pouring money, if we print the money and we'll send it into the system, is something we'll look back at and say, wow, what, what were we thinking? What were we thinking? Uh, we we thought we were living in a new world with a new regime and so on, but you know. Uh, when all, everything comes down to it, we were just living in a good old world in terms of how things are working in the economy. 
and uh, but but for now it will work and it will probably be also the tool that they will you know they will turn to when 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 things are turning bad in terms of the deflationary bust that I expect into the um, last part of this year or let's say when it starts to be felt will be twenty five. So Henrik, like one topic that we often discuss here on the channel is the, the debt to GDP ratio. The US have been looking at it is right around 120. Over the last three years, that number hasn't really changed is 120, 122, a little bit of change here and there, but uh, not not a big change. Um, now the CBO comes out the Congressional Budget Office and uh, forecasts a, a debt to GDP ratio of 140. And nobody bats an eyelid. The question is like, why do people why, why does nobody care? No, not the presidential candidates, not the investor. Nobody like there's no Main Street headline uh, about that. And uh, are they not worried that the debt is going to get called it someday uh, someday? Well, well, everybody's called. A, there's a problem since, uh, I don't know, since 2008. And now we are here 16 years later and it's not a problem. So why would it become a problem right now? And it's simply just not a good thing to call. Is it wrong that it's not a problem? No, it's not. It is a problem. It's Big, absolutely a problem and it's something that will also they will have to, to solve at some point but that is you know left for some some other day but but if you start to talk about that right now and you it's simply not just you know um, a winning point i think because you, you know, everybody would just point and say yeah yeah we said that for the last 16 years so and it hasn't been a problem so far and by the way we owe the money to the fed or to how is it that it works actually and it, uh, there was this guy coming on who actually couldn't, uh, you know, uh, explain how it all works and you know, how the, the 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 whole cycle of, of money there. So I think it's it's simply just too big to to understand for people and say, yeah, it's just and this is a, these are new times. I don't know, Kai, okay, why why people do not take this seriously, but it is a problem. Absolutely, it is a problem. Of course, we have the the, the strongest re uh, reserve currency that we have ever seen. We have a lot of demand for it, which is what we need. And it's never a problem for as, for as long as that it's strong, because then you can just print the money, and nobody really cares. The problem will be the moment when inflation starts to tick up. And I think this is what people really do not understand. The, 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 in a deflationary environment where the pressure is so strong, it's not a problem. Yet then people say, yeah, but we have had inflation. No, you have had inflation because of a spike in demand at the time where you had a supply crisis. That was not inflation. But if you start to see structural inflation coming up, well, then it'll be a completely different matter. And that is what I think will be the next phase where then this whole thing will need to be taken up. But for now, I don't think it's something people want to point to to say, well, you know, this is a problem because they will be, they just, you know, everybody just point to them and say, why do we want to care about it? Because everybody's been pointing to it as a problem for the last 16 years and it never has been a problem. So, so Henry, I think we've, we've painted a really holistic picture of where the economy is going. Let, let's see uh, how other asset classes are going to behave once we hit that recession, starting maybe in Q4 or early Q1 2025. Uh, and mainly I'm, I'm thinking about the US dollar, but also precious metals. Um, let, let's start maybe with the US dollar. Like how is the US dollar going to behave going into that recession? You mentioned King dollar is super strong, but what will, will it weaken? I think it weakens from now on. I think it, I think we have seen actually we saw the top in October of 23. Uh, actually, 22 first we had a first decline, then we had a bounce which was came into 23. Then we saw, saw a decline and we saw another bounce into to April. But uh, but I think from now on, I actually think uh, from this moment on here, we we're going to see a very strong decline in the dollar down to around 95, 93 before we see the uh, the recession sets in. And is this could actually again mirror somewhat what we saw into the financial crisis. Because if you look at the financial crisis, we saw the dollar was actually weakening into uh, the, the, the top in the market there in October. Then we saw a small bounce, the recession began, and then we saw a weakening of the dollar into March of 2008 where then the real shit hits the fan or hit the, the hit the fan at that time which means that the, the 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 deflationary pressure starts to show again we have to understand that this is where the slow um slow deterioration of the economy comes into the financial markets uh, into the banks and so on and they start to have problems and there start to be a shortage of the dollars i think this time around will be even worse than that so i think the dollar now will drop down to around as i said 93 or 95 ish area and that will blow. That will really power the uh, the blow off top, and then we will see a bounce, uh, not just a bounce, but a strong, strong rally into uh, in, into the deflationary part of this crisis, uh, which means that we should see a dollar going up to 120 on the uh, going to 120. Uh, that will not be a, a pleasant situation, and this is where the Fed will try, uh, come back in again. So, I mean, I, I I think I see the levels that we could get to, and then also why you know, in terms of the deflation and also when the Fed will start to try to um, 
to counter what they see in the in the dollar because the call dollar the strong dollar will kill the kill the economy strong us dollar um, or weaker us dollar sorry it's like if it goes to 92 93 should mean that gold is going to explode even higher than it is right now we're trading at 2350 2360 right now as we speak so like, it, it, given that factoid like let, let's talk about that you the gold price behavior um where do you see gold going in the in the interim or in the short term before the dixie explodes to 120 which should mean that gold probably completely implodes yeah but i'm not too sure that gold will actually do well in this environment here still i mean i i'm, I'm actually quite certain that it'll as i said also implode and as you said also implode in uh, when it goes to 120 but i'm i'm not certain that it we we got so much time left for gold i still say well it could reach 20 2700 but but there is also good risk that we actually did see the top already in gold and that we're starting to see that decline that could bring us down to uh, at least maybe even 1200 1250 as I, I think we could see i think there is a big decline coming because of the very very strong deflationary bust that i see and uh and and again we also have to remember how gold did from let's say the moment when uh, when we saw the dollar also starting to to rally into the financial crisis which was from march of 2008 until they kicked off qe well you saw a decline of 34 percent in gold and you saw a decline of silver 60 percent in that six month period this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about the big deflationary bust, uh, because you don't want to hold, you know, when liquidity becomes a problem, you don't want to hold gold. You hold something that, you know, you re is required to pay your debt off. So again, I'm not sure we're going to get it because also, uh, you know, there's not a hundred percent correlation between gold and, and the Dixie or, or inverted correlation between gold and the dollar. Uh, so we need to be careful here at this point because there's the beginning of you know, um, of, of, of an environment here, which will not be beneficial for gold. But of course, a lower, the dollar going lower will, you know, be somewhat of support for gold. For, for gold. And, uh, but again, I also just think there will be other better places to be, which will be, for instance, Bitcoin and for, uh, you know, risk asset, which is, um, you know, may sound strange into a crisis, but, you know, you often see these blow off tops and right into the moment where the market turns and really, uh, you know, strongly against uh, the other direction. So, so, I will be careful. I mean, why something which we know will probably get hit hard at this point? And again, I don't see palladium, I don't see platinum, I don't see silver, I don't see gold miners having followed gold on this path higher. I've seen them underperform all of these versus gold. So I think gold is the outlier. And whether it takes another move to 2700 before we move down or it drops from here, I think it will be speculative. But I, I think it's not the environment to be long gold. Um, before, again, I, as I said, I can be wrong. We up to twenty seven hundred, I think. I'm curious, like, and uh, have the fundamentals for gold changed? Like, if if you look at it, like that's why gold may be ripped. Like, we've been interviewing guests, and they said, well, it's Chinese buyers, Chinese retail buying now because they're they're um, in German. The word is concrete gold. Like, uh, has has disappeared, right? They they can't invest that anymore. The the housing market or real estate market in China has imploded there. Um, so they're looking for an alternative, which is gold. Do you think the fundamentals have changed that would uh, sort of trigger maybe a shift in thinking and maybe in the prognosis there as well? Short answer: No. I, I, this is also these are the kind of narratives that we also always hear. And then when things are starting to move in that direction, and then we have all these alternative explanations why things are going that direction. And then and then they will end up why why then does it all of a sudden change in the opposite that goes in the other opposite direction? So if I'm right on thinking that we could get a, a you know dollar that is spiking to 120, I can promise you gold will not do well. And again, I am also looking at an outlier here. I'm looking at gold, which is the outlier compared to everybody to all the other precious metals we got, and to even to gold mine miners why do we see that do we see that because maybe the whole narrative has spoken gold into our brought gold into a kind of a bubbly situation at this point i think that's more likely than that we have seen a shift in in some kind of parity or some kind of you know fundamentals here but that is the normal narrative that is what we always hear this is because and henrik you need to understand that blah 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 uh, this is i think it's uh gold will have its time and i'm i'm mass i'll be massively bullish gold just not yet Six trillion dollars are sitting in money market funds right now. And uh, as soon as the Fed starts lowering rates, I don't think it's going to be 25 basis points. But at some point, that money is starting to move and a cycle back into maybe the economy or other sectors um, where it can actually achieve a yield. Where, where do you think that money is going to go? 
Well, I think I think we uh, again at the, in the depending on where we are when we we talk about this I, I, when it will happen. I think we we will see that the the risk asset a lot of you know uh, risk assets will move a lot higher. I think the the Fang stocks will will still have a good place you know good to move, and you'll see that that is where the, a lot of this money will go for a certain amount of time into into risk assets. That's what I'm trying to say. So the into the equity markets and uh, and that will then you know funnel itself into also into crypto and and else. So. A lot of this, you know, the money that is sitting on the on the on the on the sidelines that will will, will you know find its way into that uh, for a certain amount of time. But then I think also we'll start to see that the bonds will 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 do better. I think we're getting closer to the moment where where people say, okay, maybe we should take some risk off the table. Maybe bonds at these levels, and it's actually quite nice to get you know uh, a nice return there, you know, a yearly return or a dividend. Uh, so I think there will be a a time where, where people will take some of the the risk riskier um, you know money off the table and then put it into what you know to, to us bonds especially and i think that will be rightly rightly so and that will also drive a lot of the decline in the interest rates that i that i see is uh, is coming into this crisis so, summary question henrik and uh, I, I like that one as a summary question is uh, if you were to invest a hundred thousand dollars today how, how would you allocate that money uh right now i'll put it right into bitcoin Right now, I'll probably put 50% into Bitcoin at this point here. I think Bitcoin has 110,000 target, uh, and I would do, uh, and then I would do some more on, uh, or maybe also the smaller cryptos. I think we will have a, as I said, the animal spirit will be, you know, crazy. Uh, and then I will save some cash as well. Also, that'll maybe 10, 20% of it will have, you know, just to to see if there's any good opportunities popping up here into the final. But I'll be very aware that we only have a timeline until September of October, and uh, and that is the uh that's the timeline i look into now and I, of course i will reevaluate if we get to that and we don't see 6100 6200 that i have as the s p target if we haven't reached that at that point well then we will not uh we will we, we, you know then i may you know wait another month uh, would we'll, we'll take my money out but i will be taking a lot of money off the table at the point or a lot of you know bringing my risky positions down at, uh, you know significantly at the point of uh, in time maybe in the september october Fantastic. Henrik, like, always appreciate our conversations. Like always really lively, always engaging and usually really good bit, uh, uh, back and forth. So always tremendously appreciate it. But where, where can our uh, you know, you know, viewers follow you and get more details? Well, I think it's the best way to find me is simply to get on to, uh, to on Twitter and find me at, at Henrik Seberg. And then, uh, you know, there will be links to uh, where to find me uh, there on, uh, on Twitter. Or an X, it's called. Sorry, X. I, I'm just so old. I just call it a, a Twitter all the time. X. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, I'm old enough to remember it was called Twitter. So, uh... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, fantastic. I really, really appreciate your time, Henrik, and uh, can't wait. Can't wait to catch up with you again uh, in the next three to four months. Again, we'll we'll schedule that. Maybe in, uh, we're going to see each other in Germany as well. You're going to be a keynote speaker at our Deutsche Goldmesse in November. But uh, I'm sure we'll chat before then because we have the U.S. election coming up. Uh, as well. Didn't get a chance to talk about that because I think we need to figure out who's the U.S. presidential candidate for the Democratic Party first before we make any assumptions. Um, yeah, absolutely. So fantastic. Awesome. Henrik, thank you so much. And to everybody else, really appreciate you tuning in. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions, any comments, please put them down below. Constructive feedback is always welcome. We do want to hear from you. And uh, where do you think things are going? It looks like we're already in the middle of a blow-off rally because we had Henrik on in January this year. The market was trading about 4,500 points on the S&P. We're now at 5,500 points, another 1,000 points higher. We're in the middle of it, I think. So question is, when do we start ringing the alarm bell, as Henrik said? And uh, so keep a lookout for that and to follow us and other channels as well to get educated. Make sure you're smart, you're positioned, and to be ready. Thank you so much for tuning in. We'll be back with lots more here on Soar Financially.